Welcome to Think Out, the monthly debate series of the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. At the NTU Institute of Science Technology for Humanity, we address societal challenges through transdisciplinary team research. Combining the latest in science and engineering with deep domain knowledge from social science, humanities, business, and the arts. In each think out, we bring together leading researchers and industry experts from very different disciplinary backgrounds to discuss and debate important questions that the world is facing. The NIST Medical Think Out is a series of healthcare center expert discussion on a wide range of topics from the crossroads of medical science and all other disciplines addressing global issues. In this medical think out, we seek to discuss the plausibility and the permissibility of gene editing to prepare future generations of humans for the challenge of facing them. With modern breakthrough in medical innovation give rise to dilemma and ethical questions, we question the present data of science the possible negative implication to consider and how we should navigate them. Bioethics is the study of ethical, social, and legal issues that arise in biomedicine and biomedical research. Today, we address the question, to be future fit, is gene editing our answer? My name is Sophie Karamir, and together with me, my colleague, Professor Lim Kang Leong, who will moderate this uh, session. Over to you, Kang Leong, to introduce our expert for today's debate. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Amil. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Kang Leong. I'm the Vice Dean for Research at the Lee Kong Chien School of Medicine at NTU, and at the same time, the Research Director for Biomedical and Life Sciences uh, at NTU. Today's uh, session is both interesting as well as important being future fit is gene editing the answer. And we have lined up two very distinguished key opinion leader. We have Professor Julian Sablasku and Professor Peter Droger joining us in the debate, which I shall have the pleasure to introduce in a little while. Just uh, to run through the format, uh, we will start uh, before the sharing session by both uh, professors uh, with a poll question, uh, which we will flash uh, in a little while and following which uh, Professor Shavlevsku and Professor uh, uh, Droger will, will be sharing uh, their perspective uh, on this topic. Uh, and following which uh, we will actually have a discussion uh, and then after which uh, we will take questions from the audience. So please uh, you know, uh, use the Q&A chat box to enter your question. And at the end of which, uh, after hearing the uh, perspective, from our key opinion leaders, we would like to revisit the poll question to see how much uh, their uh, sharing has actually uh, you know, changed uh, perhaps your perspective. So this is gonna be quite interesting. And at the end of which uh, I will hand over to Professor Amil again to provide some closing remarks. So without further ado, uh, let me actually first introduce Professor Julian Siavulashku, who is the Chen Sulan uh, Centennial Professor in Medical Ethics at NUS. He also directs the Center for Biomedical, uh, Bio Biomedical Ethics. Uh, but I was just uh, okay highlighted by the organizer that I have actually jumped the gun. Uh, before I introduce uh, Professor Julian, uh, we are supposed to do an opening poll. So my apologies. So let me rewind myself and ask you to respond to the opening poll. Uh, compared to a world where gene editing was not made available to everyone, do you think that the world would be a better place if gene editing was made available to everyone? So, Maitri, please give me the cue uh, if I can start uh, to introduce uh, Professor Salvalas. Okay, and here we have uh, the very interesting response, which we shall see later. Uh, whether it's going to change after we hear from the expert. So let me continue now uh, with introducing Professor Savalescu. I was referring 
to uh, Professor Savalescu as the director for Center Biomedical Ethics. Uh, he also uh, co-directs the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities. And alongside this, uh, he has a lot of, uh, of course, distinguished accolades, uh, including being a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. Uh, so without further ado, uh, can I uh, hand the mic over to Professor Savalasku to do your opening session. Over to you, Julian. Thanks very much, Professor Lim. Um, I'm going to just briefly um, describe what gene editing is and then uh, give some of the arguments in, in favour of gene editing at different levels. So gene editing is essentially the latest technique of genetic engineering or, or genetic modification that aims to change DNA. DNA is essentially the instructions for life or the code for life. Um, in all plants and animals, um, the organism is made up of cells, tiny building blocks. We have billions of cells in our body. And in each of these cells is DNA, which is the instruction for what the cell is, is going to do whether it's going to turn into skin or heart or lung or liver. And so gene editing is a technique to change that DNA, to change ultimately the function of cells. And uh, as I mentioned, genetic modification has been going on for decades, but in, in 2013, researchers were able to take an enzyme from bacteria uh, and use it in human cells. Um, it was called the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, and this system essentially cuts very precisely uh, the DNA and replaces it with the, in, the new instruction. It's a little bit like going into a library with over 20,000 volumes of books and picking out a single volume and turning to a precise page and scanning that page for a sentence and correcting a letter in that sentence. That's what gene editing essentially does. And it's been used since 2013 in yeast, um, non-human animals, and, and in human research. And in, in 2015, um, it was used to modify human embryos um, with a, a defect called thalassemia, and those embryos were not implanted. But in 2018, He Jiang Kui, uh, a Chinese biophysicist, modified three embryos, two of them known as Lulu and Nana, to modify the CCR5 gene in order to confer immunity to HIV. This caused an international backlash and, and the imprisonment of He Jiang Kui. Actually, he's just he's been released and is now lecturing again. So gene editing can change um, DNA. Why would we want to do this in, the, in relationship to, to human beings? The first distinction I want to draw is between gene editing for research purposes and gene editing for, um, for the purposes of modifying human beings through reproduction, what He Jiang Kui did. Gene editing has been used for, since 2013 to understand um, genetic disorders better. For example, Kathy Nikan in, in um, the UK has used it to try to understand why human embryos miscarry. Only about one in five embryos ever go on to produce a live-born baby. It's been used to engineer cell lines to study diseases like Parkinson's disease, uh, and it could be used to modify um, stem cells for transplantation. Indeed, there is an, another important distinction between what's sometimes called somatic gene, uh, gene editing and germline gene editing. Somatic gene editing edits the mature cells of our body, the, the cells like the skin, our white blood cells, liver, and so on. Germline gene editing edits the, the cells which give rise to our gametes and produce changes which are passed on to the next generation. Now, somatic Gene editing, again, has been used for the um, understanding of, of, of um, human disease and indeed the treatment. So white blood cells can be gene edited to improve their ability to attack cancers. So the really controversial areas of, of gene editing are reproductive gene editing um, to produce a live born baby or germline gene editing editing which results in changes to the next generation. So why would we want to do 
um, modify the germline or, or engage in reproductive gene editing. The first um, reason is to treat monogenic disorders. These are gene, genetic disorders where there is a, a single gene abnormality. Classic examples of this are cystic fibrosis or thalassemia or Huntington's disease. Gene editing corrects the abnormal gene. It's essentially an ultimate cure for single gene genetic disorders of which there are about 300. Um, normally embryos are um, discarded with these, um, with, with these genetic disorders and, and gene editing represents essentially a cure. It's in ethical terms, no different to a pill that would be given after birth that completely corrected the abnormality. In some genetic disorders, such as Gaucher's disease, there is a replacement enzyme. Um, and this is very expensive to, to produce. It, it costs about $200,000 per year to, to replace the enzyme missing in Gaucher's disease. Um, and gene editing would essentially, with one hit, correct that defect and the body would produce the enzyme uh, as, as normal. So essentially, um, gene editing represents genetic cure. It's, it's ultimately genetic medicine. The reason why it's not attempted at present is because gene editing is said to be an immature technology. Um, when you attempt to make this very precise change in one letter of the sentence, you can make changes elsewhere in the sentence, and that can cause abnormalities of development or potentially uh, malignancies from um, disruption of the DNA. And now I'll, I'll leave Professor Droger to discuss the safety of gene editing um, at the level of, of making changes to a whole organism. Um, but su suffice to say that it, it has been done extensively in animals and there are numerous um, more um, precise techniques such as base editing or, or talons than CRISPR-Cas9. And at some point, the safety concerns uh, would be addressed. Many people say we shouldn't, we shouldn't use gene editing to correct genetic disorders because we have genetic selection. We can do genetic tests of the whole genome and select embryos after in vitro fertilization, which are not affected. Um, now, this uh, replaces one individual um, with, a, with a healthier individual, and that's not the approach we take for disease in general. In general, we look for cures, and gene editing is a cure for genetic disorders. Um, and it doesn't address people who have religious objections to discarding embryos, but it's true that in general selection is, is one way of addressing disorders like Gaucher's disease. However, the second major application of gene editing is not to single gene disorders, but to polygenic conditions. Now, most of the conditions that we will suffer from, such as type 2 diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, malignancies, Parkinson's disease, are not caused by a single gene, but are caused by the interaction between the environment and hundreds of genes. And genetic selection cannot be used unless you produce hundreds of thousands of embryos, which isn't going to happen anytime soon, to address selection across many, many different genes. But gene editing can be used to modify not just a single gene, but in the case of non-human animals, it's been used to modify 50 genes. And in principle, you could modify thousands of genes. And this, it, this application, polygenic editing, could have a significant impact on the reduction of common human diseases. For example, with quantitative genetics, Peter Vischer, uh, he's recently modeled the effects on um, Alzheimer's disease, major depression, type 2 diabetes, and all of these conditions could essentially be reduced to uh, an incidence of, of, of less than one in a million if all of the associations with those, with those um, diseases, the genetic associations were causative and could be effectively um, modified. So polygenic gene editing could profoundly influence the incidence of disease. The third application is not in the treatment of diseases, but in the enhancement of normal human capacities. So not only do genes um, affect our health, they affect 
our character, our personality, um, our abilities, such as our intelligence, our musical ability, our physical ability, and so on. And roughly 50% of these non-disease traits are, um, are, are genetic in origin. And gene editing could be used to enhance the intelligence of offspring. Again, Peter Vischer and Loic Yengo um, together have modelled the increase in IQ if all of the identified um, genetic variants were causative and were edited favourably, and you would add 75 IQ points um, to the human being. Now, that's one of the reasons why China is interested in gene editing, not just to reduce disease, but to improve cognitive traits like general intelligence. And I'll just finish with four arguments for why we should think we should do this. First of all, consistency. If you had a child who had an IQ of 160 um, and the child's IQ was going to drop to 100, which is average, um, and you could give a simple intervention like vitamin B6, you should give the intervention. You should protect the IQ. Now, if a child is born with an IQ of 100 and you could increase the child's IQ to 160 with a simple safe intervention like vitamin B6, you should administer the vitamin B6 because it's better to have an IQ of 160 than 100. The only difference between gene editing and vitamin B6 is safety. But at some point, that safety will be high enough to entertain the risks um, associated with it. Initially, we would try gene editing in catastrophic um, genetic conditions like, like Tay-Sachs disease. And if it was safe there, we could try it in genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis. If it was safe there, we could try Huntington's disease. If it was safe there, we could try to reduce polygenic conditions. But ultimately, if it's, if it's proved to be safe in polygenic and reducing polygenic um, disease disposition, it could be used for um, enhancing human traits. The second argument is we modify environment, which modifies our genetics. Smoking causes mutations. Um, having children later in life causes mutations. Uh, and indeed, many of the, 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 the drugs and, and interventions that we give have effects um, at a biological level. The, the third argument is that what matters to us is not just health, but how well our lives go, how happy we are, how successful, how creative, how, how much control we have over our environment, our, our genes affect that. And if we think we should improve well-being, we should not only modify the environment, we should modify um, our genes. And lastly, justice requires it. The genetic lottery has no mind to equality or fairness. Not only are genes distributed unequally in relationship to health, they're distributed unequally in, in terms of every human characteristic and trait. And those traits like intelligence affect how well our lives go. And gene editing gives us the opportunity for correcting natural inequality and promoting biological justice. Thank you, I'll finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Savalescu, for providing the very comprehensive uh, overview and for sharing your very insightful perspective. Of course, um, regarding vitamin intake and gene editing, the question it already begs is whether one is considered as more natural and the other one uh, is unnatural. Of course, we can circle back uh, to this question in a little while. So waiting for the slides of uh, the second speaker to be shared, uh, let me just recap the poll question just now compared to the world where gene editing was not made available to everyone. Do you think the world will be a better place if gene editing was made available to everyone? And your response is this, most probably 16%, probably, 32% and probably not, and that's 33%. I'm personally curious to see after this session uh, how much uh, would change. It's now my uh, pleasure to introduce our second speaker for today, Professor Peter Droger, who is the lead principal investigator at the NTU School of Biological Sciences, where he also had the division of genomics and genetics. So as the lead PI for the Laboratory of Molecular and Biochemical Genetics, his lab touched on a range of topics, including human genetics, nucleic acids, reprogramming, genome editing, just to name a few. And he has, uh, since 2004, been a member of the Singapore Genetic Modification Advisory Committee. Uh, so 
Professor Droga, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thanks, Prof Kim. Um, I'll try to be, to be short since uh, Julian uh, already covered uh, a little bit, but I would like to start out um, uh, importantly with a disclaimer actually that um, my statements here are made uh, exclusively uh, as, a, as a person, a private person, and um, all my views are not reflecting in any way NTU's, GMAX, or my company's uh, Lambda Gen Therapeutics view. Um, I, I just, uh, because I feel it's very important that we know what we are talking about, I would just like to recapitulate um, the terms um, and understanding the terms uh, somatic cell gene editing and germline or germ cell gene editing that Julian already mentioned. Somatic cell gene editing refers basically to stable genetic changes uh, of an individual's genetic makeup without the possibility of actually passing these changes to future generations. So it's only the person who receives uh, the genome editing treatment who is affected. Germline uh, gene editing refers to the heritable changes in the genetic information for the next and future generations. That's very important. So uh, human somatic uh, cell gene editing uh, as a therapy to cure any to cure diseases has already reached clinical uh, uh, trials and the clinics globally and again benefits exclusively the patient who is being treated this is very example and there are numbers of uh, um, uh, examples for this um, car t cell therapy is probably the most uh, prominent one and these uh, treatments these gene uh, somatic cell gene editing treatments, if you wish, will increase exponentially in the future. There, there is no doubt. Human somatic cell gene editing for all other intentions, um, enhancements, again, for the, uh, the treatment of the person who will actually benefit exclusively from it, has, to my knowledge, not been implemented, um, changing eye color, uh, making you more intelligent, uh, whatever. Uh, but if it would, it would fall uh, under uh, tight regulation, similarly to what happens in, in the pharmaceutical industry when they develop a drug. It has to go to, through clinical trials, et cetera, et cetera, to be uh, uh, permissible. Uh, somatic cell engineering in other species does currently not play a role, as far as I can tell, because it's probably too expensive to treat your dog, your pet, or whatever. Now, importantly, germline gene editing in non-human species is for, for a multitude of applications is fast expanding, GMO crops, livestock, fish, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that is in the place and um, uh, there, there is strict regulation in, in most of, uh, of the countries on this planet about this, um, but a global consensus for GMO regulation is still, I think, urgently needed. Human germline editing of wild-type genomes for any reason, that is, for example, for future acquired disease prevention, diabetes, cancer, or any kind of enhancement, of, is currently, uh, currently prohibited by legislation in 70 countries in the world, so 70, but not all. Again, we are talking here about germline editing, which means editing most likely means editing of an embryo or a zygote that is then developed, developing into a full mature human being where this human being's germline is being gene edited um, and then can also be passed to the next generation. So my proposition on this particular type of genome editing, human germline editing, is that it should be indefinitely and globally prohibited by law, law so lately for the, the following reasons. First of all, there is no reliable animal models now and probably will never be available in the future that could be used to evaluate the safety and outcome of such editing. Again, I'm talking about editing of uh, um, um, an embryo that is not in any way diseased with any genetic 
uh, uh, disease background. Hence, human germline editing in this case would re represent an experimentation, an unsafe experimentation on an individual human being who cannot give informed consent because the person is not alive yet. And that will never change. So because whatever you do in germline editing, it will affect the next generation, the person who is not being born yet and cannot be uh, asked about it. Now, debatable, and that is what Julian, I, I think, referred to in, in most cases, but not all, editing of mutant genomes that carry known heritable diseases, Huntington, uh, hemophilia, etc., uh, monogenetic, polygenetic diseases that, that Julian mentioned. And uh, for this, we have actually appropriate animal test model systems that, that can be used to, to evaluate the safety. And however, also what Julia mentioned, in these cases, the inheritance of these diseases, which will manifest in the sort of next generation or in the embryo after, after developing into a full organism, could also be prevented by prenatal diagnosis and termination of pregnancies. So there is an alternative to, to, to human germline editing for mutant genomes. Mutant, uh, of course, with a, uh, it's careful to, to use this word. So parents who uh, knowingly prohibit an existing proven germline genome editing intervention could in principle be sued by their future children if they would not entertain that uh, that or allow that treatment. Another debatable exception to my proposition above is germline editing may also be considered in case that the human species is endangered and could be rescued by a certain type of germline gene editing. So with that, I, I think I come to the end and um, I guess we have Q&A sessions now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Droger, for the very thoughtful discussion. Uh, so indeed, uh, before opening uh, the floor to Q&A, uh, Professor Amil and myself would like to initiate some question. And let me first start uh, with uh, what I was uh, talking about just now with reference to Professor Savalev's Q uh, session. That is uh, the question of what is considered as natural versus uh, unnatural. So for scientific toolboxes like uh, CRISPR gene editing, we know that uh, a lot of the toolboxes we use in science uh, eventually that will be applied has uh, at least dual users, if not multiple users. It is like a, a pencil that can be used for writing. And if you are a fan of John Wick, can also be used as a weapon, right? So in this case, uh, it's about natural intake of vitamin versus uh, the perceived unnatural uh, management uh, using gene editing. Uh, the fundamental question of which is also about what is the purpose? I guess many would accept that if it is used for treatment, you will be fine. Uh, so let's talk about treatment versus augmentation. So again, it opens up uh, some ethical consideration. So if I may uh, invite uh, both Prof uh, Savalasku and uh, Prof Droga to maybe uh, share your thoughts about this. Yeah, Julian. So this distinction between you know, and nat natural and non-natural means and and treatment versus enhancement is very common, uh, and and is often deployed. It's important to recognise that you know natural interventions don't act mysteriously they act by changing our biology <laughs> and often in heritable ways so if you um, deny baby rats the love of their mother um, their hippocampus does not develop to the same degree their brain shows structural abnormalities that are passed on to the next generation through epigenetic changes um, viruses are altering our genome every day um, uh, the genome of humanity is gradually degrading um, as we're able to keep people alive longer and longer with advanced medicine. 
all of that is natural. Um, so in my argument is if if natural processes affect you know our biology and in particular our DNA, um, what's the difference between us aiming to make those changes for the benefit of the individual? Surely that's what ethics is about. Um, the natural condition of the human being is to have a life which is nasty, brutish and short, as Thomas Hobbes said, mm -hmm. to experience pain in childbirth. Mm -hmm. It's to experience infectious disease. Mm -hmm. But we introduce pain relief, vaccination, which are unnatural mm -hmm. uh, in order to promote the health and well-being of human beings. And um, likewise, we smoke, we delay childbearing. That changes our genome for the worse. Mm -hmm. um, why then can't we change it for the better mm -hmm. when we have the tools to do it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, the you know fundamental question as encapsulated by today's topic is being future fit. So it's uh, not just about experiencing and managing disease condition. It's about making human, I guess, stronger, faster, fitter. And that is uh, probably overall an augmentation. Uh, and I guess... When you think about Olympic athletes, uh, the consumption of uh, certain compounds is considered as malpractice. So let alone gene editing. So I guess you know it therefore backs this uh, whole uh, cyclical question about what uh, is considered as ethical, what is uh, non-ethical. Before we move to um, Peter for his thoughts, can I just encourage? our audience to post uh, questions in the Q&A chat box so that we would have a spirited and productive discussion as uh, intended to be. Uh, so over to you, Peter. Yeah, again, I'm, I mean, this, the question of whether uh, this is natural or not, uh, I think it's more like a philosophical question that uh, is not really applicable here because in, in, in genome editing, um, no matter for which type uh, of intention, medical you, medical cure of a disease or uh, enhancement, you know, running faster, being more smart, um, is basically um, a medical uh, intervention uh, akin to drugs, giving a drug. And it will be regulated, it is already regulated in that way. So every drug that comes on the market has to go to safety, uh, uh, evaluation with the regulatory units, clinical trials, etc. And this will not be any and is literally not any different here. So um, uh, again, I think it's, it's very important and you talk about uh, augmentation or enhancement. If it happens at the somatic genome editing, it, in, it, it will only benefit the person itself and not be in, inherited and, and transmitted. Now, this, uh, if it's regulated and, um, uh, you know, with all the safety concerns, I don't see a problem with it if it's really the desire to have a different eye color or whatever. Um, if it comes to germline editing to alter basically the makeup of our species, for the reasons I have explained, I think that should be prohibited simply because the person you are altering, or you, the, whose genome you are altering, is actually cannot be asked. Okay, so with the one exception, as I mentioned at the very end, if there is a, a situation where our human species need to, you know, be modified or need to acquire certain phenotypes, um, and we have the means to do that in order to guarantee the survival of our species. I think that could be a, a reason to to permit this. Could I could I just make one? Small yeah, please, Julian. So, so, just in response to the can't be asked um, observation, it, it's of course correct that the the future person can't be asked. But um, we have to make a decision whether we confer a genetic change on that individual or we don't. So, take somebody with cystic fibrosis. We can't ask them in the future. Do you want us to genetically modify the embryo now so that you'll be cured? We can't ask them. But if we have a gene editing procedure that we think is safe enough, we think the benefits outweigh the risks and we perform it, even though we can't ask their permission. And in my mm -hmm. view, that's completely acceptable. And, you know, 
enhancing their intelligence or enhancing their mood is no different mm. to pr protect, protecting them against a disease. It's maybe quantitatively different in terms of their well-being, mm. but it's still a question of risks and benefits. And mm -hmm. would they would would they want you to have done that <laughs> or not? And unfortunately, we, we don't have the choice of asking them and they will be committed to the future that we choose. If we choose not to do it, we're mm -hmm. committing them to a future. We're making a decision for them because we chose not to use the gene editing. And just one, one other thing on your very astute observation about doping in sport. There are four ways that you can increase your ability to, to run further or cycle further and increase your red blood cell count. Um, you can train at altitude, which is legal which causes the body to produce more erythropoid and more red blood cells. You can replicate that with a machine that reduces the oxygen and, and that causes erythropoidin to be produced and more red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Both of those are legal. Both of those are accepted. But the, the oxygen tent is not natural, but nonetheless, it's thought to be natural enough. What you can't do is inject erythropoidin directly or take the blood out of your body and retransfuse it at a future point to mm. increase the total red cell mass. Both of those are said to be unnatural, but they, all four of them have exactly the same effect and operate through the same mechanisms. And the natural unnatural distinction is something that's very primitive and psychologically programmed, but very difficult to ethically or philosophically defend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, there are wider societal implication and I dare say uh, even military implication of gene editing. And we have interesting question related to this posted by our attendees. But before I go to that, maybe I could invite Professor Amil to yes. also uh, raise his queries. Over to you. Well, can I? Can I? Since since yeah, I Peter, was ahead, I yeah. was directly addressed uh, with uh, Julian's question, I, I sure. would like to I like I'd like to comment on this. Please, please. Uh, as I stated, um, uh, germline editing of uh, mutant human genomes. In other words, that have uh, mutations for Huntington's disease or muscular dystrophy. I, I explicitly stated this is debatable. I'm not against it. It becomes then a choice of the parents, basically, whether they want to entertain this, if this is a treatment that is safe enough, has been proven to be effective. Uh, I, I, I personally have no objections, but there is the alternative of prenatal diagnosis and terminating this. So it's not uh, uh, the only choice you have mm -hmm. here. Okay, I, I think this is, is very important. And when it comes to enhancement, intelligence, I mean, this is so far out uh, to basic inheritance of, uh, of intelligence or, in, or, or enhancement of a genome so that the, the, the future human being becomes more intelligent is, is, is so far out that I don't think uh, this will, uh, in the next 50 years, be, be possible. On top of it, what is the qualification the, uh, of, 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 of being intelligent? What does it mean? And who decides on these qualifications? Okay. The, pa the parents? Okay, C can I give you an example then? I, I agree. Look, it may be just science fiction speculating about it, but but remember, when we look at the greatest genetic experiment conducted, the breeding of dogs, we can see um, the capacity to to breed more intelligent animals. That's all genetic. It's not. It's not. Um, but but so it, imagine this: you're going to have a child, okay? And they do the the test of the embryo, and they predict that there is uh, a an an eighty percent chance the child's IQ will be between seventy five and ninety five. So the normal is between seventy and one hundred and thirty. So this child is normal, normal but we'll never go to university. We'll never have a professional job. Um, and then they say to you, but hey, hey we, can, uh, we can gene edit 100 loci and we will push the probability up to 80% of an IQ of, of between 110 and 120. Um, now, for me, the same argument applies. Will my child in the future thank me for giving them the ability to go to university um, and, and hold a professional job or 
consign them to a future where they're destined to have you know a, a much a much more limited job and and future now you know you can you can disagree with the concept of general intelligence and the ability to predict iq and say this is just you know a social construct I, I think i think this is a completely uh, different uh, scenario altogether because in one case we are talking about a disease a, a real mm -hmm. physical uh, di you know in inhabitating uh, disease in, in in your case you're talking about intelligence and what is intelligence and 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 if a person um, has a lower iq and cannot go to the university Does it mean that he or she will not enjoy his life in the same way as a person who will go to the university? I mean, I, I'm, uh, I understand what you're trying to say, but you are imposing a certain view of life on the next generation. Here, we are talking about medical conditions which we can cure. Somebody who is dying of Huntington is, uh, you know, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. So again, it boils down to treatment versus enhancement. Sorry, uh, gentlemen, I just want to have uh, Professor Amu uh, the chance to perhaps uh, raise some thoughts as well. Professor Amu, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Prof. Lim. Uh, well, I, I really enjoyed this discussion and debate and I learned a lot from you know, uh, two of you, what, what you said and what you argue uh, about. Uh, and um, actually, <clears throat> I'm interested in the first questions that Prof. Lim, uh, you know, raised regarding, you know, the boundary between the natural and uh, the unnatural. And I think we can apply this to broaden our discussions about, you know, uh, how the, the nature works, uh, which is, of course, I will bring it back to the questions about, you know, gene editing later. Uh, well, uh, we all know that, you know, the, the nature uh, works in equilibrium and, And uh, take, for example, the Earth, right? And we see the Earth as a system that works in equilibrium, uh, which basically comes from the forces that it has. And some of the forces, uh, you know, release uh, so much damage uh, to, uh, to human societies. For example, um, uh, volcano eruptions, you know, uh, tsunami, and etc. cetera. Uh, but for people, for human societies, they will consider as uh, something that damages their life rather than considering as part of the equilibrium of the, uh, of the earth, right? Uh, so they try to fix it, but then they change the nature of the earth, which eventually, you know, uh, cause, you know, uh, 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 further damage to the earth. So I'm trying to think, uh, to bring this sort of a, Uh, 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 analogy uh, to gene editing, you know, what if what we consider to be damaged and abnormal in our gene genetic structures are actually part of the equilibrium of our, you know, uh, our genetics. And, and of course, this is only in you know, a human perception and, and, and they consider it to be damaged and, and abnormal and that's why they want to, you know, fix it. Uh, my question is, do we have, you know, enough knowledge to understand, you know, uh, the consequences of fixing this problem, of fixing this, you know, uh, abnormal genes, uh, not only for somatic or, uh, or and, and also germline, but we're talking about, you know, the consequences of fixing the genes in the next, you know, uh, in the long future. Uh, and... and And uh, to what extent that our knowledge today, you know, can make, uh, ensure us that, you know, the, our decision to fix this, you know, gene uh, genetic abnormality uh, will be uh, will be safe enough for uh, uh, not only for human today but also for a human in the future. So, should, can, Peter, should I go first, or would you like to? No, go, go ahead. ahead uh, go ahead, please. Okay, so sometimes this is called the playing God objection that. You know, we we interfere in a complex system with with without complete knowledge, and we we make a mess of it. Um, and and that's certainly true. We often do that. Um, in in the in the area of genetics, my in my view, the biggest problem with with um, with genome editing outside of the treatment of these monogenic diseases is what's called pleiotropy. 
the disposition of, of genes to have multiple effects. So for example, um, higher IQ is associated with higher levels of autism spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. um, manic depression is associated with creativity. So um, when we aim for you know a simple minded improvement or even the treatment of a disease, we can have these wider consequences. I mean, even in the case of disease, people often give this objection, you know, the gene for cystic fibrosis protects against diarrhea in um, in areas where, with high levels of of infection, and that we need genetic diversity to protect the species. Uh, against infectious insults. So these raft of objections say we don't know what's going to happen in the future and we don't even know at the moment what the broad effects of, of genes are. And I think that's that's a very important caution and we should certainly do more research. So I'm not advocating trying to enhance intelligence today uh, and we should certainly be looking at these broader effects. But as human beings... Um, if we believe in evolution, evolution does not aim at a perfection of an organism. It doesn't aim for us to have long, happy lives. It aims to produce organisms that live long enough to survive and reproduce in a particular niche. And there are lots and lots of imperfections. Um, and now we have science and the ethical question is, how should we use that science to improve on the imperfection of evolution? And when it comes to, to surviving from disease, we're not waiting for the genetically mm. privileged to survive the AIDS pandemic or COVID-19. <laughs> we, we, we develop prevention, preventative strategies and vaccination and, and, and medical treatments. We're not waiting for, for genetic diversity to, to... And as Peter uh, said... Sorry, Julian, sorry. Uh, sorry to interject. I would sorry. like to give some air time to Peter uh, be, sorry. Be, be, before I take questions uh, from the online attendees. Uh, Peter, over to you. Yeah, I, I mean, this idea of Im, uh, imbalance um, in the in the nat nature nat natural system sort of uh, it doesn't appeal to me at all because we are human beings, part of of nature. We are part of uh, result of evolution, and as such, our 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 activities, uh, including genome editing, is part of. Of of the of 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 nature, uh, and I don't see it in a in a very distinct way. So I don't, I, I cannot uh, really comprehend the the argument uh, uh, comparing it to earthquakes or, or volcano eruptions. Mm -hmm. But I would I would like to finish just by saying um, um, also about the safety, uh, uh, you know, treatments that are now basically almost ready to be applied to embryos to cure uh, genetic uh, disease like Huntington. Um, there, there is, that's what I also meant uh, uh, in my opening statement, there is no real comparable animal model because we are uh, at the genome level uh, in the three-dimensional uh, uh, context of a genome with all epigenetic regulations quite distinct still from even our closest uh, uh, primate uh, relative. So uh, th there is a certain um, uh, insecurity in, in, in these editing approaches. However, I would say uh, that the chances that it's safe and becomes safe is, is quite high for the treatment, even germline genome editing of certain um, inheritable diseases. Yeah, thank you, Peter and Julian. Uh... Let's move on to the online question. I would like to wrap the first two related questions together. Uh, Sonali actually asked whether a baseline level of germline gene editing should be offered as public health care, meaning make universally accessible in a community to edit away the so-called undesirable genetic traits. And of course, the implication, as the first attendee has posted, is that if gene editing is available, now would that affect existing inequalities between the rich and the poor? So your succinct thoughts, uh, please. Uh, let's start with Julian and then Peter. Uh, Peter, you go first. I've been... Dominating. Peter, go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important question. I mean, who's who's going to pay for it? I mean, if it's if it's really passing regulatory authorities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and safety tests, you know, is it, it who's going to pay for it? Uh, for eight, 8 billion people potentially uh, wanting to to have their embryos edited, uh, I have no answer to that. But it's a very mm. it's a very important question, and societies uh, have to make a decision on that and in order to make a decision i think it's absolutely uh, uh, very critical that we educate our our people uh, so that they really know what genome editing means mm -hmm. uh, and i think our uh, role here at the university if i may say is part of it but it should go even mm. uh, even further down uh, to primary and secondary school level yeah of course the hard question is that should it uh, have universal universality, right? In terms of uh, offering gene editing, it's like vaccination. Should should gene editing become, you know, a form of vaccination in that sense? So I think, yeah, but, uh, but you, you you can already see what happens to the vaccination globally, <laughs> right? So there's there's the answer. <laughs> yeah, your comments, please, uh, Julian. Yeah, if if you make it available through the market, you'll increase inequality and it will be written into the genes. So it will exacerbate inequality. If you make it available to everyone, you can reduce natural inequality. So its effect on equality depends crucially on whether it's made universally available. Now, universally here means within a nation state. The political reality is that the unit is not the, the world, it's it's the nation. So if Singapore decided to make make it available universally, it would reduce inequality because you get the, the largest benefits at, at, the, at the lower end of the curve for mm -hmm. disease, for, for enhancement of traits. And so I think if it's important, like the reduction of, of disease, um, or if you think you know a, a certain level of, of intelligence is necessary for participation in society, then those should be made available to everyone. Okay, the next two questions, I'm going to wrap it uh, together again because it's about intelligence and uh, one posted by Marcus uh, is very interesting. Uh, whether gene editing to enhance intelligence uh, would raise a concern of speeding up uh, obsolescence. So if gene editing is offered as a, uh, on a generation level, would people become obsolete as generation go by? You know, just like cell phone that uh, refresh every year, I'm sure... All of us carry uh, one of the latest model of uh, iPhone or the Samsung phone. Uh, imagine older workers becoming obsolete to a better, more productive generation at a faster rate and in status quo. Uh, so there would be perpetuation uh, in his mind of socioeconomic in inequalities. And of course, uh, the uh, other attendee actually want to find out what is the biological molecular basis for intelligence. So. Uh, over to you, Julian and Peter, for these uh, very interesting questions. We're just on the obsolescence question. So, you know, a simpler example of enhancement is, is lifespan enhancement. So, you know, some people, you know, are genetically lucky and can live to 100. Most of us can't. Now, if we were able to confer greater longevity on the next generation so that the next generation were able to live to 120 healthy. Um, in, a, in a sense, we would we won't have that. We will live to 85. Um, but in my view, that kind of inequality is good. It doesn't make me worse, and it makes somebody else better. Um, now, of course, if you believe in leveling down equality, which means if you can't bring everyone up, you should bring people down. <laughs> to achieve equality, then you, you won't allow the next generation to be smarter or to be to live longer because you want them to be the same as yourself. Now, I don't subscribe to levelling down equality. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a problem. We will become obsolete. We get older. Uh, our brains deteriorate. You know, our technological ability reduces. So what? The next generation is better off. That's the way it should be. That that mm -hmm. you know we should make people's lives as good as we can, not aim for equality. Peter. Well, well, again, I, I quote myself here saying that you basically decide uh, to to alter uh, a human being's mind, brain capacities, whatever, without uh, this person being asked. Uh, for permission, and I think that uh, is a no-go. 
So in the interest of time, let me take one last question from the online attendee. I think the one by Angelina Olsen about societal gap in a way has been addressed uh, already. Uh, so uh, let's take this question by AP, uh, which is uh, equally interesting. It's about consent. Uh, you know, is consent of the subject really the important question here? If anything for intelligence, uh, this could be potentially used to create a superior class of humans, which then make an inferior class as well. So should we be asking these future inferior humans for consent to be less intelligent, beautiful, or strong? So this is indeed very interesting for debate. Yeah, so whoever wants to go first, please. Well, but in all of this debate, there's a kind of genetic essentialism, exceptionalism, mm -hmm. where, where genetics is treated differently to, to every other intervention. Education increases IQ and it creates inequality. Um, healthcare um, creates inequality when it's, it's distributed according to a market. Now, nobody objects to education creating people who are smarter, but when it comes to gene editing, if it were able to make them more intelligent, it was, oh, we shouldn't do that. But what, what's, now, people will say education is different because the child participates and there's a communicative aspect and there are differences. I don't think any of those differences can be, you know, morally, ethically sustained. I think if we accept education as a good, which can potentially increase inequality, we should also accept gene editing if it's safe. Um, now, Peter's point is that the individual can't consent, but he made this very, very astute point in relationship to the disease. He said, if the child, if the embryo is not gene ed edited to cure a disease, the future child could sue the parents mm. for failing to correct. But in exactly the same way, a child could sue the parents for failing to increase their IQ when they had the ability. They could mm. say, why didn't you make me smarter? Why did you choose not to use this? So mm -hmm. I don't see a difference between editing for di diseases and editing for enhancement. Thank you, Julian. Some very quick thoughts from you, Peter. Well, I still think there is a fundamental difference between uh, choosing uh, to which school you can go and 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 choosing uh, or not choosing whether your parents decided to enhance your your mental capabilities before you were even born. I think there is a fundamental problem there and and a, and a difference. Um, uh, and I also think the, the concept of intelligence, IQ, uh, uh, if this becomes so clear cut in the future that you have, you know exactly how many thousand genes you have to edit in order to get which outcome. I'm on your side, Julian, but uh, I don't see that. I, I don't see that happen, uh, not in our lifetime and probably not in, within the next generations. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I guess uh, the major concern for gene editing is that it um, adulterates the very fabric of life that is our DNA, which, which is why it raises uh, so much uh, controversy. But um, I'm really appreciative uh, of the spontaneity of the discussion today. Uh, and I'm sure uh, our audience uh, would agree that this has been a very spirited and productive discussion. So before I hand over to Professor Amel, uh, can we call up the poll question to see how much opinions has swayed? So there you go. And please uh, go ahead to vote. So while we wait for the poll questions uh, response to be up, Professor Amel, can I hand it over to you? Uh, by the way, okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Lim. Uh, I just wanna uh, draw a few uh, uh, conclusions uh, from our discussions, which is very, very uh, useful, at least for me, to learn about you know gene editing. <clears throat> so, from uh, uh, you know from a sociological perspective, I think you know we can consider gene editing as a sort of a techno medical platform that is now emerging these days, offering you know a, a lot of benefits uh, for society. And the, the, the medical benefits of uh, gene editing are real. As you know, Professor Sofalasku already you know, mentions that this is a sort of a ten of fix that can you know, um, uh, alleviate you know, the issue or the problem of natural inequality and will uh, raise a, uh, a sort of a biological justice uh, to society. 
but of course, on the other hand, uh, the risk of gene editing is also real. Uh, and there's also uh, some aspect of this platform that uh, should be examined further, not only from, uh, from the technical or medical uh, aspect, but also, of course, from the ethical and legal and the social. And this is the questions uh, that becomes more important when we bring all of the questions about you know, natural inequality and biological justice to the social context of our society today. Because I think when we talk about uh, uh, you know, uh, gene editing as a technomedical uh, platform, uh, the questions of access uh, is fundamental. Uh, and this is similar to many <clears throat> you know, uh, many products of healthcare and, and medicine. And the issue that uh, uh, that uh, the, the access to gene editing probably, you know, uh, not, not evenly distributed is something that we need to consider. So I think that's the question that, you know, uh, uh, some of us are asking here. Thank so, you very much, uh, Professor Amir, for your closing remarks. I've just received the poll results. So gentlemen, uh, this is what we have uh, from 16% probably <clears throat> not, uh, sorry, from 33% uh, uh, probably not, uh, we now have 16%. So the majority have actually shifted to probably and mm -hmm. most probably. So most probably uh, we had 16% in opening and now we have 36%. So gentlemen, uh, Definitely your insights and expert views on things has helped to sway opinions, hopefully in the right direction. So on that note, uh, you know, please join me to thank Professor Savalaskiu and Professor Peter Droga uh, for giving us uh, such a spirited and insightful and productive uh, discussion by sharing your expert opinion. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, so I'm now going to hand over again to Professor Amil uh, to just do the closing. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Lim. So that brings us to the end of this medical thing cap. You know, our thank go to uh, Prof. Julian Safinescu, a widely known expert in bioethics, and also to Associate Professor uh, Peter Druch, uh, uh, which is a decorated you know, local geneticist. And to our speakers, as a token of appreciation, you know, our Think Up water bottle, a huge collector's item is coming your way. Uh, audience, thank you so much uh, for your participation. Uh, please follow up on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to learn more about uh, this debate series and access research papers and information on both today's uh, speakers. And we look forward to you all joining our next Think Out that will be announced soon. And be sure to register and join the discussion. Thank you all and bye. And may I take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day today. Happy Have a Valentine's. good evening, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye.